ready to go. All right. Great. All right. Well, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, I am very excited to be introducing this program. So I am Heidi Alexander. I'm the director of the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court Standing Committee on Lawyer Wellbeing and also the VP of Communications for the Institute for Wellbeing in Law, um, which has organized all of these great programs, including this one this week. Um, this program is in particular, as you can see here on the slide, is part of the Wellbeing Week After Party, um, again, which is an event of the Institute of Wellbeing in Law. This is also being sponsored by the Professional Development Consortium. Uh, the idea behind the After Party this week, which is a separate week from Wellbeing in the Law, um, whereas Wellbeing in the Week in the Law focused on the individual side of Wellbeing, uh, this week is focusing on the organizational side of, of Wellbeing. So of what are those bigger picture culture changes, policy changes? What are the things that we can be doing uh, in, in firms, uh, by legal employers to really make changes that will impact uh, the well being in the workplace? And so um, there are a number of free daily webinars that are happening. Uh, the Well Being Week team has also created a number of different resources on the website, including readings and videos and, um, and, and more. Uh, and so there was a, a planning team that was part of it. So um, you can see on the on the slide here, uh, there's a, a, a number of people that were helping with this. Um, but obviously, the 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 our leader who should definitely be recognized, uh, Ann Bradford, who is the chair of Wellbeing Week, uh, and also organized the after party. And so. Um, again, we invite you to be a part of all of uh, all the events this week. You can go to the lawyerwellbeing.net website. There is a specific uh, page for Wellbeing Week in the Law and the Wellbeing After Party, again, with lots of great resources. Um, so with that, I want to transition into our panel discussion. And I would like to um, first uh, introduce our moderator, who is then going to introduce uh, our panelists who are phenomenal. And I just, again, could not be more thrilled to have all of these people here together in one place. Um, I, I am just so excited to, to listen to what their insight and experience and, um, and I think we're going to learn a lot from uh, from everyone here. So I want to introduce Denise Robinson, who is a former practicing lawyer and she is the founder of the diversity consulting firm, The Still Center. So Denise, I want to hand things, uh, things over to you to get this panel started. Thank you so much, Heidi. Hello to everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on this uh, panel discussion. And thanks to those who will be watching uh, the recording uh, later. I am thrilled to be the moderator for this panel. I too am very excited to hear from all of our panelists. Um, and I first want to just say thank you to um, the Institute for Wellbeing for all that they've done with respect to the uh, Wellbeing Week in Law, um, this after par party series of uh, programming. Special thanks to Heidi Alexander, who you just heard from, um, in terms of taking the laboring or um, and pulling this panel, this particular panel together, as well as to Ann Braffer for her amazing work with respect to uh, Wellbeing Week um, in law and all that she's doing with respect to well-being um, in the legal profession. Um, before I ask the panelists to introduce themselves, I just wanted to provide just a little bit of context, kind of starting with a little bit about my background, um, and then weave that into what we are hoping to accomplish um, in terms of our discussion today. So um, as you heard, I have a consultancy called the Still Center, which is a diversity, equity, inclusion, and wellness um, consultancy. I've been doing diversity, equity, and inclusion work primarily within the legal profession for over 15 years. At this point, um, I started out in actually in higher education and I'm um, in a law school and then moved into um, a law firm diversity uh, roles, a series of roles ultimately culminating in being a diversity director for um, a global law firm. And then I moved to the International Monetary Fund where I did uh, diversity work as well. And then I moved out as an external consultant about eight years um, ago. So that's my diversity um, background. My wellness work has grown out of uh, being a yoga teacher, which I've been doing for the last uh, 10 years. 
um, actually a little over 10 years now. And I regularly work at the intersection of diversity, equity, and inclusion and well being. It seems very sort of obvious the connection uh, between those two topics um, to me. And I'm sure that many of you who have joined uh, this discussion today are doing so because you see the connection between these two topics. But we also know that our colleagues perhaps don't necessarily right, understand um, those, the relationship between diversity, equity, and inclusion, which I will continuously refer to as DEI, just so you know what I'm talking about, and then um, well-being. So what we're hoping to get out of um, our discussion today is really um, three things. So first, we just want to know what does it look like and what are the different ways in which law firms in particular are integrating diversity, equity, and inclusion and well-being the pros and cons of having DEI and well-being responsibilities in separate roles or separate positions or within the same position. So we'll have some variety um, on the panel that you can hear from on that. And then the third thing is we want to hear some specifics, right? Some specific initiatives um, that have come out of these collaborations um, with a particular focus, of course, on what is working well so that some of you who have joined us um, can perhaps take that information back to your um, employers. So with that, I would like to ask my uh, fellow panelists to uh, introduce themselves. I'd like to start with, I'm just gonna kind of go by who I see <laughs> on the screen first. So I'm gonna start with uh, Catherine Adamenko. Thank you so much, Denise. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Heidi. It's such a pleasure to be here. I'm Catherine Adamenko. I'm the manager of well-being at Ropes and Gray. I've been at Ropes and Gray for about two years in this new role that was created as a manager of well-being. I've also spent 15 years in the fitness and wellness industry in the past nine, specifically in wellness itself. Um, so it's a privilege and honor to be with a fellow guest today. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. And now I'm going to ask your uh, colleague <laughs> at Ropes to introduce herself, Kia Scipio. So one of the things that is always my challenge, it doesn't matter how many Zooms I do in a day, I'm always muted when I think I'm not. So um, now that we've gotten that out of the way. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Kia Scipio, and I am the Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Robeson and Gray, and I have the fortune of being able to work with Catherine in, our, in the areas in which uh, DE&I and well-being intersect. Um, I joined Robeson and Gray just a little less than two years ago, um, and I have been doing diversity, equity, and inclusion work um, both officially and unofficially in the number of roles that I've had both in law schools and law firms for I'm not even gonna tell you how many years, I'm just gonna let you all think that I am really young. Um, so I, but I, um, the evolution of DE&I um, along with pro bono, along with well-being, um, and the intersection of those things while also recognizing that they each stand alone as well um, has been pretty remarkable over the years. And, um, and I would I look forward to sort of the conversation that we have, especially um, as we talk about the fact that these roles, as is evident by uh, Catherine and I, are oftentimes separate, though there are oftentimes opportunities for um, that intersectionality. And so, you know, what does that look like overall? And, and I'd love to hear people's views. So, um, so that is my story. And I will turn it back to Denise to introduce the next person. Thank you, Kia. Um, the next person is Lori Capello. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Lori Capello. I'm with Mintz, which is a large law firm. And I've been with the firm for more than 20 years. And as of April 4th of this year, my title has changed to Director of Wellbeing. I'm actually still straddling my old responsibility, so I haven't transitioned fully. Um, but my prior responsibilities was as the Director of Benefits, HRIS, Payroll, and Firm Policies. So I've been working in the well-being space for a very long time and very much looking forward to being able to focus fully in the well-being space. Thank you, Lori. That's that's exciting. I actually did not realize that you had just <laughs> transitioned in terms of your titles. That's great. Thank you. Um, and then as Zoom would have it, your colleague, Nargis Kakalia, um, is, is next. Thank you, Denise. I'm so excited to be on this panel today. Thanks so much for having me. 
Um, I am also at Mint's. Um, I've been at Mint's for almost as long as Laurie has, um, 18 years and counting, but only six months of those uh, of that time has been spent as Director of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion. Um, I was a uh, summer associate, a litigation associate, and then a partner at Mint's um, for the rest of the time. Uh, so I am getting my sea legs under me and Lori's been hugely helpful and a tremendous collaborator. Um, and I'm excited to be here. Thank you, Nargis. And we have Yusuf Sakir, who's next. Thank you, Denise. Thanks everyone. I'm so happy to be here. Uh, my name is Yusuf. I'm the Chief Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Officer at Davis Wright Tremaine. I've been doing d &I work now for about six and a half, seven years. But at Davis Wright, I've only, to, similar to Nergis, I've been here for about six months, uh, was at Holland Knight before and Latham and Watkins before that. Um, began as a lawyer, practiced law for uh, five-ish years and then transitioned over to the DNI space. Um, I think, you know, to the point that all my fellow panelists have made, I mean, over, the intersection of DNI and and well-being has definitely strengthened. And I think probably especially so since the pandemic began. Uh, and, and not only the COVID pandemic, but all the other multiple pandemics that we've been dealing with um, and how to manage and get through it. And so, um, and still persevere. And so I'm really excited to be here and talk to you all about it. Great, thanks to all of our panelists for uh, introducing yourselves and let's get into this. Let's, I have a question for you just to kick things off. And it really is one um, about sort of structure within your firms, your respective firms. I'm gonna um, ask Yusuf to, to kick this off since he had to go last in terms of <laughs> introducing um, himself. But first the question, the question is um, to whom do you report? And what are the what do the resources look like that are dedicated to whatever you know your role is? So for Yusuf, since you're doing it sounds like all of it, <laughs> I'd love to know kind of what does your team look like? Is there a team in place? How are other functions within the firm um, supporting you? And like I said, kind of going up, like where who to whom do you report and what does that look like? And then we'll move to the others. Absolutely. Um, so in my role here, I report to the firm's managing partner. Um, as part of the broader C-suite. So it's me, the CFO, the chief marketing officer, chief uh, operations officer, um, the chief pro bono officer, and all of us sort of sit in the C-suite and report directly to the managing partner as part of his team. Um, as part of that team, we also then function very closely with the executive committee, which manages obviously, as you can imagine, the policy and governance of the law firm. Um, and then our work obviously intersects across the firm, right? It intersects with recruiting, it intersects with professional development, with human resources, with marketing. Our goal ultimately is to be able to integrate D and I across the firm, right? And not just bake it in, to bake it in, not, not layered on top. Um, I've been fortunate here. We've built out our office of D and I here at Davis Wright Tremaine fairly quickly, uh, where we're getting it as of a week ago, we now have seven full-time uh, team members in our office of the ENI here, which is pretty different, quite honestly, from I think how things have been historically. And I think maybe it's a recognition that, you know, we are, you can't just have one person do this work. <laughs> it doesn't really work like that. Um, and, you know, our, our job is not to create a, a silo in the office of the ENI, but it's to create enough resources where we can really intersect and engage with everything that's going on in the organization. And so I feel grateful that, you know, we've really been able to build out a team here and, um, and, and have rolled out a new strategic plan for 21-22 um, that I think will, will really help us get to where we want to get. That's great. I heard seven and I nearly fell over because... <laughs> <laughs> as we were discussing in our sort of pre-meeting before this, um, when I was a diversity director inside of a firm and it, this was typical of firms, so I'm certainly not, you know, calling out that, that firm. Um, but there were, at one point, there were two of us. I was actually the second diversity professional hired uh, within this uh, global law firm. And that was actually kind of um, unusual at the time to have two. Many firms in the sort of AmLaw 100 space had one, if any, 
Um, and then we went to sort of one and a half. Once I got promoted to director, essentially my position was not replaced um, um, for quite a while. And then when I left the firm, there was really one person for a while and it has since um, kind of evolved into about three people. So <laughs> I'm glad to hear that there um, has been some progress, at least in terms of uh, DWT's experience. So let me go to, um, let me go to Lori, um, because your, at least your title is new, although I suspect you've been kind of doing this work along with the many other hats that you held for a very long time. What does your structure look like now in terms of your role? So as uh, director of benefits, et cetera, I reported to the chief operating officer and as director of well-being, I will also be reporting to the chief operating officer, which is fantastic. Um, we've actually had a well-being program at Mint since 2006. It started out, you know, very small and it has continued to build and really over the last several years, become a real, something I can feel very proud of. Lots of people collaborating, thankfully, lots of support from the top. When we took the um, ABA Wellbeing Pledge, we then developed a well-being committee. So we have representation from every Mint's office. We have associates. Um, my co-chair is, is a very well-respected female partner in the Boston office. Um, and so we try to get, you know, feedback from all the different levels and area of the firm. And I have to say, even the leadership as far as administrative departments, practice managers, et cetera, have been extremely supportive of our initiatives. I'm having uh, the issue that Kia talked about, making myself get off mute here. So <laughs> Nargis, if I can come to you, um, being at the same firm as Lori, kind of what, a, what does your structure look like as you're sort of, I'm sure, building out? In your yeah, I um, report to both the chief operating officer and the chief executive officer, who also happens to be the managing partner of the firm. Um, and so I uh, work very closely with, I have the great benefit of having worked with the managing partner for 18 years before I got this job. So um, I have a close relationship with him, which really, really helps drive my agenda on a weekly basis. Um, and I feel very fortunate because I know that a lot of uh, DEI professionals don't, don't get to have that. So it, it's a huge plus for me. Uh, my team is me, um, one other professional and really the whole firm. And I don't shy away from picking up the phone and calling all my colleagues and saying, you know, I really need this. And can, you, can one of your team members pitch in and help? Um, part of that is my stealth plan for making sure that everyone at the firm does DEI work. Um, and part of it is just, you know, having a lot of hands on deck, which, which you need for the work. Um, and some of it has actually helped me make the case for a larger team. So, you know, cross your fingers for me. Hopefully that's happening soon. <laughs> Absolutely. We will. We will. Um, if I can go to Catherine to ask the same question, what is, what it the structure look like at ropes in terms of sure. Well um, I sit in total rewards, um, which uh, formerly kind of was all the, the benefits, much like Lori. So I report to our director of total rewards, um, who also who reports to our uh, CHRO, our chief human resources officer. So we work very very closely. Often everything kind of goes up through our CHRO, um, as well. And um, just like Lori said as well, we have uh, committees, we have local well-being committees in all of our 11 locations, six in the US, one in London, and four um, in Asia. And part of my role was also uh, to balance, to globalize the strategy, but expand very locally. Um, I'll have a little bit more of a conversation about why that's so important. Kind of, I, I do it like that, the lawyer scale, right? So it's globalization, localization. And so we'll have a conversation. I'll have a little bit more of a conversation of how also we're kind of um, working in well being and diversity um, for the well being side, you know, how to get that out through our people on a local level. That's great. I look forward to that. Um, let's hear from Kia in terms of what your structure looks like, and then we'll come back to this balancing. Yeah. yeah, so I um, my I report to our uh, chief talent um, and our chief talent and global mobility attorney talent and global mobility officer, um, but also have a direct uh, dotted line report to our CHRO. Um, 
And I think that um, while those are the people to whom I report directly, I do on a regular basis connect with our firm's managing partner. Um, we have a, we call each other if something's up, um, he calls me, I call him. Um, and I certainly, you know, have access to our chairwoman as well. So I feel, you know, regardless of sort of how we're structured, I have the ear of our firm leadership. Um, we have our diversity committee um, that is also, uh, that includes members of the policy committee. So through the diversity committee as well, there's that um, access to leadership and, you know, firm leadership and being able to sort of go directly to where you need to. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's always a simple um, sort of just pick up the phone and call somebody to get something to happen. But, um, you know, knowing you sort of have the ear of firm leadership on a regular basis, um, that is very helpful. Um, but I love um, how Nargis said that she worked, you know, she has the whole firm involved because if we're doing diversity, equity, inclusion, and well being right and doing it well, it's something that is embedded into all of the firm's systems, processes, all the things that we do. And so it really shouldn't be, you know, to Yusuf's point, it's not like you're creating a separate and apart, um, you know, department or organization within the firm, but more so creating an opportunity to develop and build out resources that are accessible and utilized by everyone at the firm. And so um, that is sort of how I approach the work that, you know, my team does in DEI is that we're sort of, you know, it's almost like, um, I always say it's kind of like a bad rash, like, you know, just when you think you might have it under control, it creeps up somewhere else. And I don't want to compare DE&I to a bad rash, but my point being is it should be everywhere, right? Um, as well as, you know, the considerations and the um, inclusion of wellness and well-being. So, um, so that's sort of the, the way I approach it in the structure at Ropes. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all for, for sharing that. And I hope that those who are um, with us in the audience are kind of recognizing there are a lot of different approaches, right? So there's not one way um, to go about it. Um, I do think the, the points about just making sure that everyone sees it as they're or working toward everyone seeing it as their responsibility, it being DEI and well-being, frankly, um, as their responsibility. Um, but that that requires a lot of work. So I want to come back to uh, Catherine to maybe talk more about this, the idea of the, the scales um, that you were saying, sort of approaching your job is to kind of have that that global um, str strategic approach, but then how do you carry it out at the at the local level? And then where does DEI come in? With that? Yeah, in, in fact, it's funny. I just uh, Keen and I were just having an interesting conversation um, last week a little bit, a, a little bit about it, and maybe we talk about it in the sense of a global lens and a local lens as well. Um, I was sharing key with this. I've been doing wellness, well-being specifically for nine years in a similar role. Um, you know, nine years straight. And it wasn't until we had um, some anti-bias training, Michelle Sil Silverthorne came in for a couple of workshops and it just struck me. And I realized I had my blinders on regarding networking. She gave a great example about social networking um, of who you know, of who you know. And of, of course, those listening here in the well-being industry, it's all, how do you get vendors and how do you source them out and who do you know? And now that I'm working in the legal industry, it's actually even more tighter knit, it's very specific as well. So it's a small circle. And basically, once you, you, you realize after that, I, I looked at myself, well, what are the circles that I have? and that I've created and how, how diverse they were and they weren't. And so the idea was the easiest thing that I can share on a local level is who do you bring into your office for your programming? Is it always um, an XYZ type person? Um, and it's just could be standard, is it expected? Have you done your due diligence in research, right? How long does it take to do an extra email, right, to some of your colleagues? Um, how long does it take to do an extra Google search? And what I found a really great example of this, as we were developing hand in hand with DNI, looking at diverse instructors, so like how, you know, opening up and widening our lens. For example, we were um, 
in looking in for a diverse yoga instructor, of course, all through last year and George, George Floyd and the whole social justice movement, we found that many, almost every diverse instructor we were looking at, were they were working within a community and social justice. And we thought that was really important for us. So that piece alone, there was this, this huge added um, uh, benefit to us of even connecting our initiative even more. And so that's what we do on the local level um, regarding. So now we encourage all of our local committees, make sure you have that same lens on. So right now we're nationalizing because we're virtual. So a lot of our programming has gone virtual out of the localized. But when we return to office, that same local, that same lens has to be on. And then quickly, I'll say on a global level, it's all about partnership, right? So I work very, very closely um, with uh, Kia's senior manager, who used to be the well-being committee lead in New York. So I was, yeah, it was like a perfect natural relationship. And so um, from strategy development to sitting on calls with instructors to recaps, hey, what do you think? To, hey, here's what we're planning um, on a global strategic level. It also helps me because then I know what's going on in the DE and I space, like there's nothing that I'm gonna do ever now without having that, um, you know, and then also in our strategic kind of team, I call it our, our well-being dream team, you know, representation from DE and I has to be on any kind of strategy we're doing. That was fantastic. Thank you, um, Catherine. I'm curious for others, um, do you have some specific examples? I love what Catherine shared about thinking about, and of course this would resonate with me quite deeply as a DEI professional, a black woman who is also a yoga instructor, <laughs> um, your specifics around, you know, who are we bringing in? And not just with respect to well-being, right? Because some of you, like others um, on our panel, but some of you in the audience probably have many different hats. So thinking about, who are you bringing in for the CLE work, you know, that your the, the providers that are coming in to do that? Or, you know, who are the other vendors who are providing services to the firm? Are we really thinking about that? Are we looking at it through that diversity lens, um, as Catherine was pointing out? So I might um, go to Yusuf and then um, ask the MINTS team to, to talk about if you have any specific examples of kind of how you've integrated well-being in, in DEI. Yeah, no, happy to kind of talk a little bit about that. So I think one, one of the things that I talked a little bit about earlier is how do we really make sure that we are working across our organization on this issue, right? Because this is a human problem, a human challenge is something we want everyone to be able to be concerned about and everyone to be thinking about. And I think for that, at our organization, that means really working closely with human resources, with professional development, with recruiting, with all those components. Um, and I think over the last year, a lot of our focus has gone to how do we support uh, the well-being of our folks as we're working remotely um, and as we're planning essentially a transition, you know, back to whatever the new world will look or the, what the new world will look like. And so to give one example, I mean, we've seen a disproportionate impact on parents as an example, right? um, and people, not only parents, but people who are also taking care of um, uh, elders in their family and sort of that elder care and child care, those, both of those things have caused a lot of stress and anxiety for folks. A lot of the studies we've seen, obviously, that a lot of burden has disproportionately fallen on the shoulders of women. And so how do we ensure that folks have the resources that they need? And there's not always a perfect solution to this. Um, you know, there's, we, there's not always a, a way to make it work uh, perfectly. But I think one of the things that we've done is really acknowledged it, first of all, acknowledge that people are dealing with these sorts of situations, acknowledge that we understand that we're human beings, we bring that humanity with us to our work, which at right now is at home, right? Um, and so the threshold of our office is basically our bedroom or our office or whatever the case may be. And we're, it's the lines are all blurred. And so one of the things that we've tried to do is provide more resources for our parents specifically in that regard. And for our folks with, with elder care uh, as well, um, we've also upped a lot of our resources and benefits available to those populations. Um, and also, one thing that's really been interesting on this point too, a lot of us who are in this situation right now are thinking about our own futures in the long term. 
um, and how we can kind of better position to take care of ourselves in you know, 20, 30, 40 years. And so one of the benefits that we've also recently um, uh, offered here in, in a new sort of way is how can we begin to plan for that? Um, and so sort of elder care, longer term care benefits that we can start to make investments in today so that we are not uh, in as much of a difficult situation as maybe some of the folks that we're taking care of today. I mean, I can personally tell you, I'll give a personal example of this. Maybe my parents both are, have, did not plan uh, for, their, uh, for their health and for their retirement. Um, and I know many of us were in the same situation where everything kind of falls on the shoulders of the folks that are taking care of them. Um, and so that, we realized at the firm that many people are dealing with that. And so we wanted to address that situation but also address the fact that we can begin to prepare for this and our firm can help you prepare for it 20, 30 years ahead of time, right? Um, and so those are some of the things that we've been thinking about here. Love that both hand approach of, right, we're in this crisis, but then how could we plan for the future so that we don't find, there will be another crisis. There will be another pandemic of some sort or another, as you pointed out earlier, you said, right, the multiple pandemics, I talk about it that way um, as well. This is not gonna be the last time, maybe we won't have another COVID, you know, global pandemic this way, but there will be something certainly in terms of the racial injustice that we see the, you know, disproportionate impacts of, um, our lack of support systems around care, et cetera, um, how that impacts women. That's not going away, it's not changing um, until we have a real sort of societal um, cultural shift. And yet there are things that we can do at the organizational level to at least help you know, those within um, our organization to um, mitigate perhaps uh, some of those concerns into the future. That's great. Um, Lori and or Nargis, I leave it to either of you um, or both of you to speak to what are some of the specific examples of ways in which you've um, in integrated DEI and, and well-being, recognizing that both of you are new to these, these very specific roles. <laughs> um. You know, well, I don't, I'll just like level set a little bit and then let Lori speak. Um, yeah, I read a survey recently. It's an older survey that 60% of people of color um, feel uh, throughout their working lives that they're on guard every minute of the day. On guard, you know, bracing against um, gender bias, ra racial, racially animated bias. Um, the the um, symptoms of anxiety and depression have more than tripled in Black and Latinx communities over the last year, especially following the murder of George Floyd. Um, and then there are all the health outcome disparities, right? Um, where Black and Latinx people are three times as likely to get infected, twice as likely to die of COVID. Um, there is no way that one discipline or department of, of a workplace can possibly address all of those issues within its workforce. So it's, it's incredibly important for all of us to work together. And for me, it's been um, wonderful to have a partner in Lori because I get to learn from her on a, on a daily basis, right? Like how do we build support structures? How do we help with anxiety? How do we build resilience in all of our populations? And then how do we get our communities to work, all the communities within the firm to sort of work together to address some of the issues? Um, anyway, I'll turn it over to Lori uh, to talk more about that. Thanks, Nargis. So throughout the COVID time, we've done a lot of um, emails, education, highlighting the various benefits to support those that are caring for either children or elders, expanding some of them, doing time mastery webinars to help people, you know, dealing, working from a remote world. Um, so many different offerings. We developed a COVID-19 webpage where employees could go to that specific page and find the recordings, but also links to our healthcare providers, mental health providers, EAPs, LAPs, and trying to keep consistent messaging, you know, throughout the year and, and being supportive. Um, and then specifically to your question about the collaboration with Nargis, um, you know, I've long felt that inclusion should be a part of the well-being program. I just didn't know how to do it. <laughs> and when I found that Nargis was going to be the person because we had had a wonderful working relationship all along, I couldn't wait 
for her to officially start. I think I was one of the first phone calls, not only to congratulate her, but to say, you know what, I have this great idea, I wanna collaborate. And she was amazing from day one. So just to give one example, what we were able to do fairly quickly is add inclusion as a component of our Empower, that's the name of our wellbeing program, where we have a page and we put information regarding Nargis and, and her support and what they're doing. And then also we post as she very often shares information, we're able to cull from that and post it on the inclusion page so that we know that the information we're sharing is quality, it's accurate, accurate it's supportive. I couldn't do it without Nargis. So, I mean, and that's, you know, that was just an amazing opportunity. And then the one last thing I'll say on that, which is, which is on the page and, and should be um, known for everybody on this. And some of you do know, because I do see some of the Mindfulness and Law Society people here with us. Um, I happen to be the vice president of Mills and also the co-chair of the New England chapter. And uh, Mills has a year long collaboration with the Na National Black Law Student Association, where we're hosting monthly conversations and they have been amazing. So if that's something that you're not familiar with, check out the mindfulnessandlawsociety.org website and um, we'll be having hopefully the registration available for the May conversation shortly. But you know, those are, quality things that you know we're able to share with all mints employees and again would not be possible without nargis that's great um thank Denise, you for sharing I, yes please go right okay. ahead Argus. can i just add one last thing one of the things i've been struck by during the pandemic is that people's usual support structures um they haven't had access to those like you know you no longer have your weekly um, the ability to go weekly to your place of worship, for example, or community centers or having, you know, five of your closest friends over for wine and cheese so you can talk about the issues that are really bothering you in, in the moment or in the day. Um, but the one constant has been work and, you know, for us at law firms, we're fortunate to have that, but it has been the one constant. So it's become even more important for the workplace to really address some of the issues that people are seeing every day um, and, and to be able to take a multifaceted approach to address those issues has become, you know, even more important. Absolutely essential to your point. Um, I think that's such a great um, point to raise that this might be the only um, sort of connection, social network um, that we can tap into, at least on a, you know, regular basis in a way that um, it's quite different than uh, pre-pandemic for many people. So thank you for, for raising that. Um, and, and really um, sort of bringing that into the inclusion discussion, I think as well, because I think often um, people think of, um, well, that's something that sort of affects perhaps everybody. So how can it possibly be an, be an inclusion <laughs> issue or a diversity issue or an equity issue? But um, it, first of all, it, it does, everyone is diverse as I like to share and dispel myths when I'm doing my diversity trainings, right? All of us, you know, across our different social and cultural identities, none of, no two of us are gonna be exactly alike. While yes, our equity efforts are gonna focus on particular groups because of the ways in which, you know, our society um, is, is structured and different so social hierarchies, et cetera. Um, but then the work of inclusion is in fact work for all of us, we're all gonna be affected differently by this, the, just the health pandemic, right, that we have going on, and then all of the other ways in which we are experiencing trauma, that, that's going to affect different groups differently. And yet, because, because of the way that um, COVID has impacted the way that we um, engage with each other, we're all affected in some way or another. Um, and so in many ways, work mm -hmm. is going to be that common denominator um, for us. So so thank you for um, expanding <laughs> our views on, you know, what is included within DEI. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to jump in there, sound like one of you may have, so please feel free if you want to. But um, I wanted to kind of move into one of the very sort of specific pandemics um, that we're dealing with. And all of you have touched on this, but I just kind of want to drill in um, on it as we're starting to uh, wind down here in our era in our hour together. And that is to, in reflecting upon the racial justice um, 
various events, you know, um, impacting racial justice over the past year, including what we've talked about, you know, I've heard George Floyd named um, many times. Um, we want to talk about the, you know, anti-Asian mm -hmm. violence that um, is ramping up again within um, our society. It's not the first time, just like the, you know, um, anti-Black violence um, or racism that we're seeing is not the first time. And yet, we are in a moment where um, we are um, inundated day to day, right? Some of us very personally, um, but all of us, right, are seeing these um, events happening. And we have people from those identity groups within our profession, within our firms, um, and it impacts all of these impacts, all of these um, um, pandemics are impacting those who identify as BIPOC, who identify um, as, you know, um, people, other groups that have been targeted um, with violence quite directly, right? Um, there's the concept of weathering that um, I'm sure some people have heard of on this, um, on this webinar that um, it's basically a way in which um, at a physiological level, racism, other isms, right, Islamophobia, like you name it, transphobia, whatever it is, starts to um, have a negative physiological impact on people who identify as part of that group, even if they have not been targeted directly with violence, right, or targeted directly with um, for other forms of um, hatred, you know, against their group, there's a way in which just being a member of those groups that are um, that are lower in our social hierarchy, um, there are physiological negative and physiological impacts um, on these groups. So I'm just wondering what and any of you can take this, um, if anything your firms have done to really target and address BIPOC folks, um, Asian folks within your firms um, who are experiencing not just the COVID-19 pandemic in a particular way, but these other racial justice issues. Go for it, Kia. Oh. <laughs> so I'll just mention, you know, and, and I'll use this as an opportunity to just sort of bring up some, um, you know, maybe perhaps a different perspective of some of the things that we've talked about. One of them being, you know, how we're preparing to care for people based on things that are happening, happening external to our organizations. Um, but the reality of it is, is um, many of us have our roles because of things that are happening internal to our organizations that are certainly impacted and affected and influenced by what's happening externally. But there's a recognition that there needs to be some work done internally. And so the events of last of this past year um, have really just sort of shown the bright light on what we're doing internally that sort of impacts people. And so while you may not necessarily be the subject of a violent interaction on the street or, you know, a um, very direct racial incident, you know, um, perhaps involving law enforcement, there are those folks who every single day deal, deal with those, you know, as we call it, death by a thousand cuts, right? So it's the, the, um, the mispronunciation of a name. It's the misgendering of someone. It's the, um, you know, sort of not acknowledging your role as a leader, perhaps, or that you're somehow, you know, in a, in a support role when you're actually the attorney leading the case because you don't look like what people expect that you do. Um, it's when your colleagues who recognize that there are issues and that something um, inappropriate or wrong has happened, but they don't speak up. Um, it's all of those things that people live with on a daily basis that, you know, it's, it's not, you know, the physical or verbal attack that happens elsewhere, but it's what we have to live with and um, sort of deal with on a daily basis in our communities in which some folks mentioned might be our, our, our place of socialization or has been at least for the last year. Um, and so the roles for the DEI professional and the well-being professional become even more important because now we are really helping to shift the cultural thinking and behavior within the organization so that when these things happen externally, there is a, pay, a place within your 
or you're from, your whatever, where you can find some solace and not sort of feel like, oh God, here we go again, here, right here at, at you know, what at X, Y, and Z organization. A simple thing like when the events of last, last um, year happened, in particular, right after George Floyd, with George Floyd's murder, and, you know, people sort of launched into regular meetings without even acknowledging what was happening in the world outside right? And how that impacted people within working groups and how, you know, people said like, how do you expect me to focus on X, Y, and Z when somebody who looks like my, my father, somebody who looks like my brother, somebody who looks like me was just senselessly murdered, right? For, for a fake $20 bill, um, you know, or, or, or the fact that, you know, what people tended to talk about was the violence that was created by, you know, the protests or whatever, and not necessarily the people who were actually out there for good, but for others who were instigating, right? That was what was talked about. Oh my gosh, if anyone's feeling unsafe because, you know, this is happening in your neighborhood and not if anybody's feeling unsafe because we realize that in this day and age, anything could set someone off, right? That's when, um, you know, having resources available, having a safe space within your organization, having the opportunity for people to gather and speak about the concerns that they have for their physical health and well-being um, was, I think, is something that's incredibly important. And so I, you know, and, and that's one of the things that I always think about when, you know, um, when I started out the conversation and I mentioned how we all sort of, while we have diversity, equity, and inclusion, wellness and well-being, and pro bono, and that there is a lot of intersectionality, one of the things that we found, and I think others here who, who have done de and work in particular, when we started talking about addressing issues, people always sort of sought the opportunity to be a solution solution focus externally as opposed to looking at what was going on right within the organization. So when you talked about doing DE&I work or doing some kind of a wellness work, it was like, oh, how can we help these other organizations of people who are so disadvantaged? And it's like, actually, how can you help the people that are right within your community that you work with and deal with every single day? How can you create a space for them where they can have, have um, space in which they can just be? How can we create opportunities where people can just have conversations without fear of any kind of reprisal? So that's the kind of thing for me that is so important. Like, yes, the external pieces and the external partnerships and all of that are very important. But what to me is just as important, if not more so, it's kind of like that old adage, you got to take care of home before you can start taking care of everything else. And so it is creating those um, those um, synergies and collaborations and um, intersections within the organization and recognizing that the diverse person who maybe hasn't been, you know, verbally abused external to the law firm, but comes in every single day and has to sort of deal with the stereotypes around them needs resources for how do I deal with this? How do I mentally not crack? How do I mentally, I live a very duplicitous life. There's the me that you see at work. And then there's like the me that's not at work. How do we help people navigate that? Um, and I think the next thing that we're going to see, you know, as we bring in new classes of, of attorneys in our law firms, many of whom have never stepped a foot inside a firm a day in their life. Right. So they're coming in and they're hearing about all these different initiatives and this and that, that that our organizations are touting and using as great marketing and recruiting tools. But it doesn't change the reality of what life is like for many, particularly those who are diverse in a law firm environment. And so how do we prepare for that? How do we prepare for another group of folks that are going to come in who, you know, have dealt with the pandemic, who have dealt with the racial and social reckoning that's happened, and now they're coming into these organizations that are like, yes, we do all this and that, but at the end of the day, they have a bottom line. And these things are important, but that billable hour is really the the you know the crux of all of this and so how do we prepare resources for these folks who are coming in who have no idea what they're about to get into i feel like we could um 
<laughs> just have a whole panel on everything you just said. Um, so many things <laughs> to name um, just in terms of those daily slights. I just want to name that as what we talk about in terms of microaggressions, right, or micro inequities um, in diversity, equity, and inclusion professional speak, right? That's what we're talking about, those daily, um, often subtle, perhaps sometimes unintentional slights that people who are often, you know, in a group that is marginalized within both the firm and then also the broader community are dealing with the dual consciousness, right, that results from having to um, be, try to be, right, within an environment that does not reflect you, and in many ways does not, um, is not, has been, not historically anyway, has not been supportive of uh, perhaps, you know, people who are from um, these marginalized communities. So I, I just um, want to just continue to highlight and elevate what Kia is saying in terms of look inside, right, deal with your own sort of internal um, firm stuff around these issues. Um, first, right? That's the first place to pay attention. Um, even as you are doing the community and pro bono work, that's important as well. Um, but don't, don't do it at the exclusion of um, missing out on how people are being affected within, within our employers. Um, I'm going to open it up to others. I know we're getting close to the end of the hour, but I know that others want to speak. So go for it, Nargis. To say, um, I, I couldn't agree more with Kia, and I'm so glad you said what you said about looking internally first. Um, the other thing, I, two things I wanted to mention. One is it's really important for leadership to show up in the work. Um, and I don't mean the chief diversity officer, I mean the leadership of the firm. Um, and, and I know that sometimes it can be a struggle and it's uncomfortable um, for who undoubtedly is a white man or a white woman to show up in this diversity work. Um, but it's, it's really important for them to do so. And I view it as my job to sort of push the envelope on that front a little bit. The other thing I will, I just wanted to highlight is that we've been opening up space within the farm for all our employees to build community around these traumatic events. Um, so we did it most recently, um, actually when the Chauvin verdict was announced uh, the day after that, but then we also had an open forum for discussion right after the Atlanta murders um, and the rise of violence against uh, Asian American communities. And, um, you know, what really struck me in the session that we had on anti-Asian violence was that our black colleagues showed up not just in solidarity, but to actually provide um, guidance on how best to take care of yourself when you find yourself in a traumatic situation like that, um, which was incredible to witness. Uh, when we had the open forum to discuss the Chauvin conviction, um, you know, our, our white colleagues actually showed up to talk about the many times that they've witnessed um, racism and how they've either regretted just watching or how they've taken action. And I think these are incredibly powerful moments for building connection and community, um, which in turn sort of helps with all the other things we've been talking about, sort of resilience and overcoming vicarious trauma. So thank you, Catherine. Yeah, I wanted to, to just share, um, one of my favorite things to do is kind of share the how-to um, after uh, doing this so long, kind of really practical. Um, really the work when we brought in uh, Jamila Pitts last week for Wellbeing Week in Law for a yoga, yoga mindfulness and social justice class, I posed a question to her and her uh, of like, well, what can we leave, right? So what, what can you guys leave with? And what one of the number one things is, and we talked about this kind of for the firm looking internally as Kia just mentioned on itself. And I think especially if you are not um, from a BIPOC community and you are in this space, um, that you co-present, if you're bringing anyone um, regarding um, in the well-being and diversity space, you, you need to bring 
someone from well-being and diversity with you with that introduction ask that partner in your with dni when you're presenting and bringing that person listen i know that there's mistakes the foot in the mouth as i navigate this you know of i kind of was given great counsel on this as well um and you learn each time and that's one of the biggest learnings and then just other little how-to things as well that we've done when we present something, for example, firm wide and it has a deck and it has photos or it has graphics or icons, even that alone, that sense of whoever is going to be looking at that from the firm, that there is a sense of inclusion. So even as a well being, it's not just bringing in that instructor. It's really important, as I mentioned, the lens. And kind of, I can leave you with this brainstorm, write down like after today, start writing down as a well being manager, a program manager of all the ways in which you can bring that in and then go through that list with your diver, you know, DEI partner. So more how to's, always happy to give how to's. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure the audience appreciates you, appreciates that, um, Catherine, as practical um, as we can be. Others with, um, I see Yusuf, um, please go right ahead. No, yeah, I just, I'll keep it brief. I think that a lot of, obviously, what everyone has said has re resonated with me. I think Kia, a lot of what she said, too, I think essentially mirrors what we've done here. And it's kind of a triage, right, over the last year, which it has been a triage uh, in some ways as to what's going on and how to respond to it. And I think there's three things in particular we've tried to do. One is, so it's acknowledgement, it's space and it's tools, right? So acknowledgement is making sure that we're actually acknowledging that these things are happening, right? To Kia's point, you can't just show up to work the next day, pretend like nothing happened. So after the election, after the January 6th insurrection, after the Atlanta spa shootings, after the Chauvin trial verdict, the day after that, each of those events, our managing partner sent out a communication on those events talking about how folks processing these things that, that we're all on the same page, right? We're not ignoring what's happening. It's not business as usual. Um, second, after each of those things, we had spaces for people to come together, right? I know it's virtual. It's only so much you can do virtually, um, but actually bringing people together and having small breakout discussions, two to three, four people in a room. I participated in all of them and they were honestly the, the some of my favorite actually moments at the firm to be able to get in a room with people and just talk through these things um and we're processing right and as we process it's nice to be able to actually bounce off that processing off of somebody else uh, which we may naturally have done if we were all in the office or all in person but we don't have the chance to do that i can't really bounce this stuff off my kids and so i gotta you know to have a space to be able to do it with others uh, is helpful and then three is tools right so how do we you know we brought in michelle too to talk about broader unconscious bias training but we also um, provided for our, our attorneys of color and our staff of color specific tools around, okay, we know these barriers exist, right? Our job is how are we gonna, gonna get rid of them? But as they exist, we gotta figure out how to break through them. And so here are some of the tools that you can use to kind of break through them to persevere while we recognize that they still exist. Long-term goal is that they tear the fence down, right? That's the long-term goal. While the fence is still there, how do we cut through it? How do we get through it? And so that I think is a, we have to continue to acknowledge that as our systems remain imperfect, as our processes remain imperfect, uh, we need to figure out how to succeed in, in spite of that. Um, and so, so those, those are some of the things we've been trying to do over the last year. That's great. We have. That's exactly right. Right. It, it is going to be imperfect, and we still have to do the work. <laughs> I think it's um, a great message to um, conclude on. I do before I. Uh, head it back over to Heidi. I just want to acknowledge that um, someone put in the chat some resources, I think also a specific kind of how to. Um, so we'll go over to the chat. Hopefully it went out to everyone um, if you want to uh, check that out. So thank you um, for uh, the person who submitted that. Um, Heidi, I will kick it back over to you and thank the um, panelists, all of you, for um, sharing your wonderful um, insights and all the resources and how to's and just ways of even thinking about um, approaching this intersection. All right, well, first, I just want to say thank you to Denise and all of our fantastic panelists here. Uh, obviously, we could continue this panel, I think, for hours and hours and days, and, and we will keep continue to have these conversations. And so 
I, I really appreciate everyone being here and sort of just starting to get you know a taste of how we can all be working uh, on these efforts together. And I know we we are and we're trying to and um, and we will continue to do so. So thank you all. Um, here is again our information about uh, other events happening this week, other resources. Uh, tomorrow, there will be another um, uh, webinar at 1 p.m. on practical advice for curbing the work-life conflict crisis in your firm. So uh, again, all these are free opportunities. Um, and um, thank you to everyone who has, uh, has made this a reality. So uh, appreciate everyone being here. Thank you again. Thank you, panelists. And thank you to everyone.